Okay, so welcome to Math 349, Operations of Order. So I wanted to finish the Ben Hood lecture right now, which is to try to give us you know, a little bit of a sense of possible topics you can do with the Fibonacci's as a springboard. So the Fibonacci's occur in so many different things across mathematics. It's not surprising that you see them over here as well. So we talked a little bit last time about certain numbers are going to be uh, Benford. And when we did the Fibonacci's, the key input was Binet's formula. This is one of my favorite formulas in all of mathematics. So much of math is about taking something, even if it is easy, and finding ways to do it quickly and efficiently. We all agree that arithmetic is not hard. Adding numbers is not hard for people here at Williams College. But that doesn't mean that you want to do it, and it doesn't mean that you can, in a reasonable amount of time, do quadrillions and quadrillions of additions. So Binet's formula allows us to jump to the nth Fibonacci number. And because one of the two factors is greater than one in absolute value and one of them is less than one in absolute value, as n becomes very, very large, the second term is just essentially going to zero. And it's extremely unlikely that the second term is enough to change the leading digit. I would have to have my number looking like nine, 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 and then this is just enough to push it up. It wasn't like one, and then just enough to pull it down. So it's very unlikely that happens. You can go through and you can quantify this. So this is all you know, very standard. We talked about how most recurrence relations are Benford. It turns out that there is a generalization of Binet's formula that allows you to write down explicitly solutions to recurrence relations like this. And for the Fibonacci's, what's nice is you get a characteristic polynomial, you get a quadratic polynomial of degree two. You get r squared uh, equals r plus one or r squared minus r minus one equals zero. You find the two roots. And then it turns out if something is a solution to the recurrence, you can multiply it by any number and it's still a solution. If you have two solutions and you add them, it's still a solution. So we can write down all the solutions easily. As a nice challenge, what happens if two of the roots are the same? Then you don't get two independent solutions. And there is a trick that you can do and I'll leave that for you as you know, a nice problem to think about. And in fact, the two roots being the same is exactly what happens in the recurrence relation here when you have a n plus one equals two a n minus a n minus one. And if you haven't seen the solution, the fact that you can write down explicitly what the answers are in these two cases when the roots are both one, that might give you a hint as to what the answer is in general. And so again, you know, I'm not giving you a tremendous amount of homework for this class. This is a good thing to try to think about. See if you can figure out how would you solve a recurrence relation if you have a repeated root. Over here with two distinct roots, we can write down something like this. What happens if the root is repeated? We then talked about one way to show that something is Benford is to show that the log mod one is equidistributed, false evenly, that the fraction of the time it lands in any subinterval of zero one is just the length of that subinterval. And how do we show that a number is equidistributed, a sequence is equidistributed? Well, we had this beautiful result that if beta is irrational, then n beta mod one is equidistributed, it falls evenly. And clearly beta had to be irrational because if beta is something like one fifth, then you'll just go, you know, zero, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, zero, one, and just keep cycling. It's enough to be irrational. If you want to then quantify how quickly equidistribution sets in, this leads to a lot of really interesting arithmetic questions. And they become ways to talk about how irrational a number is. And there is a number which in a reasonable metric is more irrational than any other number. So let's say we are following a sports team. What statistic might be a good statistic? Wins, okay? I think we can all agree. You know, we don't really look at moral victories. Oh, look, we lost in triple overtime. We're gonna count that as a moral victory. You know, my parents are retired to Arizona and the Wildcats finally had a you know, good win against a top ranked team, but they had two very tough losses. We care about wins. It's clear that that's a good statistic to look at. When you're looking at numbers and trying to get a sense of how do you determine how irrational a number is? Well, it turns out that there are good metrics for that. Does anybody want to guess what is the most irrational number? And I'm not even telling you what the metric is. 
And there must be a reason I'm asking this question right now. What do you think the most irrational number is? It's got to somehow make sense with what I'm lecturing about right now. The golden mean. So there is a legitimate sense in which the golden mean is the most irrational number. And that sense is if I want to try to approximate an irrational number by a rational number, the golden mean is the hardest to do that. How many of you have ever used a computer? Okay, this is just you're seeing who's awake right now at you know, you know, 10 a.m. Okay, everybody's used a computer now. Computers can only do finitely many operations on integers. You know, a computer cannot work with arbitrary infinite precision. So it has to approximate irrational numbers by rationals. So in some sense, the golden mean is the hardest one to approximate with uh, rational numbers. And when we start to try to show that you know, the Fibonacci numbers are Benford, what matters is how quickly does the Benfordness set in? And that's going to be related to some interesting questions about the ability to approximate the golden mean by irrational. So again, I'm just trying to give you a sense of possible topics for this course. I know at least one person is interested in Benford and Fibonacci. So here is some data. So this is the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. We are still a unified department. We should have some understanding of how to look at data. So I have looked at the first 60 values of two to the n. Now the numbers start to grow and I'm running out of space to show everything on the table. So I'm only gonna show you the first 30 values. And I'm gonna record the first digits and how often do I get a first digit of one through nine? And I'll write down the observed probabilities versus the Benford probabilities. So my first question is, eh, overall, do you think it looks like the powers of two are Benford? Does it look like a pretty good fit? And if you have any concerns, which digits concern you? Yeah, I think it's a decent fit. And if you take a stats class or probability class, we can quantify how decent the fit is. Now we know that two to the n should be Benford because the log of two to the n is n, the log of two base 10, the log of two base 10 is irrational. So by our theorem, these are going to be equidistributed. So when we exponentiate, we get Benford. Okay, so we do know that two to the n is Benford. The question is how quickly does it set in? And it is related to how well can you approximate the log of two base 10 by rational numbers? When you look at this, are there any digits that look a little concerning to you? Eight, five, I don't think that's the most concerning. I'm sorry. I would say nine is the most concerning. You know, the observed probability is 0 0.017. The predicted is 0 0.046. That's you know on the order of magnitude of like two and a half, three times. You know, if you look at eight, eight is off by a bit, seven is off by a bit. One of the problems is small data sets. And again, what's nice about this class is we're not in any rush to get through a bunch of material we have the time to really stop and think. What was the greatest baseball season of all time? If you know me, the answer is obvious. Which season? In 2004, the Red Sox were down against the New York Yankees three games to zero in a best of seven. They had to win four games in a row. No team had ever done that in baseball. What is the probability of winning four games in a row? So, oh, I'm sorry, the, it's an open question. So give me one possible model. It's okay if your model is wrong. Give me a possible estimate of the probability of winning four games in a row. 0.5 to the fourth of one in 16. I think only on the order of 24 times had a team ever been down in baseball, three games to zero in a best of seven. So no one had ever come back, but you would only expect it to happen once out of every 16 times so with 24 instances, you would expect maybe once or twice. So zero is not that much less. So the fact that it never happened, isn't that surprising? Why might the probability not be one in two of coming back? Yeah, maybe there's a reason why you've lost the first three games. You know, maybe you're not as good of a team or maybe you're just not as well positioned. In 2005, the Red Sox made the playoffs on the last day of the season. They had to keep winning games, which meant that they had gone through their top pitches recently. The Chicago White Sox had clinched a playoff berth a few days earlier, 
and they were able to rest their starters and they swept the Red Sox in the playoffs. And so sometimes there could be very natural reasons why you are down three games to zero and it may not be a 50-50 chance. But with only 24 instances, you would expect one to two times a team to come back. The fact that no one's come back, that's not that surprising. So when we look at something like this, the number of data points we expect to have is really small. We only expect to have about 5% of the numbers are going to be a nine. If we see 60 numbers, 10% of 60 is six. So 5% of 60 is three. So we'd expect three numbers, we see one. All right, it's a little bit low, but it's not terribly low for small values. What you frequently do is you might group a bunch of things together. We might group seven, eight, nine, or eight and nine together. And if you group them together, then all of a sudden it's not so bad because there's so few occurrences that just one extra observation is enough to really mislead. Uh, there's a great problem called Buffon's needle, which you sometimes see in probability. If you have a bunch of parallel lines of a fixed separation and you throw a rod of a given length, you can ask how often does the rod cut across lines? And it turns out that if you look at a certain ratio of the rod length um, to the separation, that that's going to be related to a multiple of pi in terms of the expected number of crossings. You can use this to estimate pi. And somebody claimed to do this and estimated pi to eight digits by allegedly throwing rods and seeing how often they landed on a grid. And someone else noted, you know, if this person had happened to throw one more rod, no matter how it landed, his accuracy would have gone from eight digits to three digits, something like that. It's almost as if he started off with a really good rational approximation to pi and chose that to be the number of throws. And so you know, it's not a proof that you know, the person did not do the experiment they claimed to have done, but it was highly suspicious in terms of what was going on. Small data can be misleading. When we look at this, you, know, you might think eh, it's a little bit bad for small numbers, but we expect to have so few instances down here. And this is a point that you really need to hammer when you're writing things. You should not be convinced by uh, fluctuations over here. There's just not enough data to have any confidence. What could we do to become more confident? More observations. And it's not that hard to do more observations of powers of two, especially if we only care about the first digit. You just keep calculating them, not gonna to be too big of a problem. Okay. Now, um, here is a key observation. Two to the 10th is 1,024, which is about 10 cubed. Who here knows computers? All right, how many megabytes are there in a gigabyte? It should be a thousand if you understand what mega and giga mean, but it's actually 1024, I believe. I'm sorry? It's well, it is and it isn't. Do we want to make the classical scholars happy? Yes, I want everyone in the world to be happy. I want everyone to be happy. That's my goal. But if we have to prioritize, am I allowed to do that anymore? I am, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm never sure anymore what I'm allowed to do. You know, if I have to choose between the classicists and the computer scientists, and I really don't want to do this, but I'm being forced to choose against my will, I have to choose one group to make super happy. I will choose the computer scientists because we're dealing with computers, right? So that's the only reason I'm choosing them over the classicists. Computers work in base two. So if you do 1,024, that's two to the 10th. That works very nicely for computer architecture. 1,000 cubed, that works very well for humans with hands. All right, well, if I'm doing something with a computer, I want to do something base two. I don't want to do something base 10. Now, what's really nice is 1,024 is very close to 1,000. So what this means is every time we increase the power of two by 10, it's almost the same as padding by three zeros. In the world where two to the 10 equals a thousand, then there would just be constant cycling of the digits. And every time you increase by 10, you would get the same leading digits. Because it's off by a little bit, by that 2.4%, this is where the Benford's law comes from. Now you can see why I wrote the numbers like this. You can see as you look at each horizontal row, 
I'm just slowly increasing, but it takes a while before you have a leading digit that's different. So 512 becomes 524288, then 536, dot, dot, dot. 32 becomes 32768, 335. You know, it's going to be a while before any of these. So if you notice, we don't have any sevens, we don't have any nines. It's going to be a while before the eight finally gets large enough to give us a nine. It's going to be a while before the 64. I think the seven might come in before we get a nine. Yes. Well, so the, the, so the hope is that you would get some limiting behavior that as n gets larger and larger and larger, things would converge and it would not fluctuate. So the problem is not everything converges. So if I look at, say, a street, and um, we'll, 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 we'll do that later. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that. But we will actually see that for certain problems, depending on where you stop, you will get different probabilities. And there is nothing that, there's no convergence that happens there. For something like powers of two, it will converge and eventually the fluctuations become lower order. And so we're gonna be fine. Okay. Um, I've chosen three of my favorite numbers. Can you recognize any of these numbers? Gamma, E, and pi. Everybody has seen pi? Has everybody seen E? Has anybody seen gamma? So gamma is another one of the famous irrationals. And gamma is, if you look at the sum of one over n, and let's go to the harmonic series, one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, this diverges. Does anybody know what it diverges to or how quickly it grows? So the sum of one over n, n less than equal to x, approximately how big is that? So approximately how big is this? If I sum the first n terms. No. How would you approximate a sum? You can approximate this with an integral. One over t dt. And then that would be the natural log of n minus the natural log of one. So this is about the natural log of n. So if you look at the sum of the first n reciprocals, it's approximately the natural log of n. And what you can do is you could then say, how far is it from the natural log of n? And either that difference or the negative of that difference is Euler's constant gamma. And then there's low order terms, but they, they differ by a constant in the limit plus you know, things that are smaller. So gamma is a very important number. When you look at these, I'm doing what's called a chi-squared test for goodness of fit. How many of you have ever seen a chi-squared goodness of fit test? Okay, almost everyone has seen it. So if you haven't seen it before, all you need to know is that there is a way in probability and statistics to compare if your observed probabilities match a conjected theoretical distribution. And the closer you are to matching, then the smaller the fluctuation should be. So you know, if all of my observed probabilities equal to the benefit probabilities, okay, I'm confident it looks benefit. The more separation they have, the less confident I am that it's benefit. But again, with small data, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not perfect. And so there's an advanced theory that tells you, you know, if your conjecture is correct that this is truly the underlying distribution, then 95% of the time, when we look at what's called this chi-squared value, it should be at most 15.5. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at different values of n, and I'm looking at the chi-squared value. So I should be less than 15.5 if it's converging, if it's you know, really following Benford's law. What do you notice about this data? Yeah, so when I take n equals 100 for pi, it does not look close to Benford. But what happens as n gets large as I look at more and more points? What happens to the chi-squared value for pi? Is it, is it constantly getting smaller? No, it oscillates, but it doesn't seem to get as large as it used to be. But maybe I'm just choosing things at very special points. You know, maybe it was 
much higher at 438. And I'm deliberately not showing you that. But it does look like it's fluctuating, but the magnitude might be decreasing. What about pi? And, okay, that's pi. What about E and gamma? How about those values? What do you think? Do you they're fluctuating as well. They're not going straight down. So as we're getting more and more data, it's not getting closer and closer. But are the fluctuations large or small? Yeah, so I mean, it looks like these are pretty good fits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the log of the chi-squared versus n. And so I only showed you a couple of values of n before. I'm going to show you all values of n now. The reason I'm doing a log, and in fact, I'm going to be talking about logarithms and complex analysis. So if anybody is uncomfortable with logs, you can just watch the video from complex today. One of the reasons we love logarithms is they allow us to look at objects that have very different orders of magnitude. And we can talk about them all at the same time. If you look at the previous page, you know, we go from 46.65 down to 0 0.05. That's three orders of magnitude. It's really hard to see, you know, features that fine. But if I take the logarithm, I can now plot them all on one picture. So the smaller the value, the more likely it is that it truly is benefit. And so the log of the critical value is about 2.74, I think. All right, so when you look at this, the blue is e to the n, the red is gamma. So we can see that the values of you know, the chi-squared values for the e to the n look pretty benefit. You know, these are getting very, very small. And there are fluctuations. It's going up and down, but there's this general downward trend. When you look at the red, do you see a trend? What do you see when you look at the red? Yeah, it looks like the peaks are getting smaller. So maybe we have this kind of pattern that's periodic with a shrinking amplitude. I mean, does that look like the same rough shape? I can zoom in a little bit. I mean, I, I think that looks roughly similar. You know, without going into your very detailed analysis, I definitely see a lot of very similar features in this. So we're seeing that the benefitness of pi to the n, if this is correct, if the amplitude keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, as we take more and more values of n, it's going to become benefit. So who here knows digits of pi? All right, go. That is more than I can do. The ones I knew, you definitely matched. All right. Who can do pi squared? Thank you. Thank you, exactly. Nine. This is sad. You know, we learn digits of pi, and nobody learns digits of pi squared. I will assume people do not know digits of pi cubed. So if you keep doing digits of pi, you eventually get to pi to the 175. And when you look at pi to the 175, you get 1.0028 times 10 to the 87, if memory serves. Yes. What this means is every time I go up and increase n by 175, it looks like I have appended 87 zeros. I probably should have done this the other way. I should have asked you, can you give me a rough sense of looking at this? What do you think the period is of the reds? If you look at it, 175 looks like a pretty reasonable estimate for the period. I would not be surprised by then guessing that pi to the 175 should be very close to the power of 10. That every time I increase pi, the n by 175, I've essentially just appended 87 zeros. Now, when we did powers of 2, every time we increased by 10, it was 1.024. We were off by 2.4%. Here we're off by 0.28%. It's less. 
It's going to take a little bit longer for things to set in. And so again, the whole point of this is to be a springboard. There's so many different things you can discuss. And a big part of this is trying to understand data, trying to look at data and get a sense of what story is it telling. And here we can see that there should probably be something interesting about pi to the 175. And then of course the question becomes, which numbers are such that if you raise them to a specific integer, it's close to 10 to another integer. How can you find such numbers? Okay. So let me talk a little bit about long, about you know, why benefit sets in, and this answers the question you asked early, and I knew it was you know, coming uh, later today. So not every data set is going to have this digit bias. So let's imagine we have a long street with L houses labeled one, two, three, all the way. And I, what first, the first, well, there's a huge difference if L is 199 versus 999. If it's 199, we just stopped with 100 houses starting with one out of 200. That's a huge percent. If it's 999, we just went through essentially 800 houses without seeing a one. And out of 1,000, that's a huge amount. So the probability of being benefit oscillates between 1 ninth and 5 ninths. And so there is not going to be a limiting probability. So unlike the Fibonacci's, depending on where we go, we are not going to see everything converging. Uh, this is an advanced topic. I don't want to get into it too much right now, but you are allowed to do a small amount of discrimination in mathematics. You don't have to treat every number equally. And so if we put weights on the houses, if we put the most weight on house one, the second most weight on house two, the third most weight on house three, and so on, then in this weighted system, you can actually show it does converge to benefit. So there are ways to regain this is called the natural density. There's something called the analytic density, which occurs in number theory. The weight on house K is one over K. If you do something like that, you can get this convergence to benefit coming up if you don't count everything equally. And so if I plot what's going on, here is my plot. And so you can see that they all have roughly the same amplitude going up to five ninths and going down to one ninth. One of the big things I want you to get out of this class is how to look at plots, how to look at pictures. And a lot of times we're not looking at things the right way to truly see the relationship. So we know Benford's law is related to logarithms. You know, if the logarithm mod one is equidistributed, then the data is Benford. Well, what if I looked at things on a logarithmic scale? Because going from, you know, a thousand to ten thousand, maybe that's similar from going from ten thousand to a hundred thousand. And so if I plot things on a log scale, notice all of a sudden the behavior becomes very nice, very periodic. And that's essentially because up to very small correction terms, you know, if I go from a thousand to ten thousand, okay, houses from a thousand to one thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine will all have first digits of one. My probability is going to be skyrocketing up, and then I'm going to drop all the way down. Then if I go from 10,000 to 100,000, from 10,000 to 19,999, it's going to go up and it's going to skyrocket down. And the ratios are going to be approximately the same. You know, the difference between 19, uh, 1999 out of 10,000 versus um, 199,999 out of 100,000, very, very small difference in those fractions. And that's why these become indistinguishable to the eye. And if you look at this on a log scale, the behavior now becomes, I think, more apparent as to what's going on. Okay. Now, this was doing one street. What if we have many streets? Because, you know, how many of you have ever seen the movie Pleasantville? I guess no one has seen this. Um, so in, in this movie, there was, you know, two streets in the town. I think there was Main Street, and I forget what the other one was. Um, might have been like Elm, because, you know. Uh, no, um, Toby Maguire, I think, was in it. I, I can't remember now, but I, I think they only had two streets in the town. And so uh, they, they were basically doing like a geography class in, in the school. And geography was very easy in this world because there was Main Street and there was one other street. You know, Williamstown is not quite that bad, but I think we're competitive in terms of you know, what geography is like over here. But what if we have many streets of different lengths? Do you expect to have Benfordness there? And one of the very first things we looked at was the 
first digit of the street addresses of, say, professors. Why do you think that might be benefit, but the first digit of street addresses of student mailboxes in Williamstown might not be? You all live in dorms, and what's your mailing address? Presky. So you all have the same physical building for your mailing address. So we would not really expect to see much of a distribution in leading digits. So let's imagine we have a hundred streets and each street goes from one to 10,000. And we wanna look at the first digit and the first two digits and compare that to benefit. So the benefit probability is the you know, downward sloping blue line. And then the first digit and the first two digits, they're gonna just be from the uniform distribution. You know, all the streets have the same length. So I know exactly what fraction of the time I'm going to have a first digit of one. It doesn't matter which street I choose because they all have the same length. Now let's make things a little bit interesting. So I'm again gonna take a hundred streets, but now each street, the length is gonna be a random number. And I'm gonna choose a number randomly from one to 10,000 and I will choose the numbers uniformly at random. So I'm as likely to choose 15 as I am to choose 24601. Actually, no, I'm sorry. What's the chance? What's probably I choose 24601 for the street length? Zero, right? I chose something too large. I could do 1701. You know, 1701 is less than 10,000. So 1701 and 15 would have the same probability. If I look at this now, so some streets will have small length, some streets will have large length. And if I look, I can see, okay, it's closer to Benford, but it's not Benford yet. I can make it a little bit more random. What I can do is I'll have a hundred streets and I choose a number for each street randomly from one to 10,000. And then whatever number I chose, say I chose 1701, I then choose a number randomly from one to that. And that will be my street length. I'm gonna do a two-step process to just make things a little bit more random and not just a nice uniform distribution. Now, if you look at this, does this look pretty close to Benford? Yeah, what do you think would make it even closer to Benford? Yeah, three random. And so if you keep doing that, it gets more and more Benford. So you wanna start developing some techniques to analyze and quantify how close is this. So have we done a probability review yet in this class? All right, so just quick probability. And again, a lot of you are doing projects where probability will be a very useful thing to have. If you haven't seen it before, these are great things to see. So we'll talk about random variables with continuous densities. So this means, P of X is non-negative, it integrates to one, and the probability we take on a value between A and B is just the integral from A to B of P of X dx. Is it possible to give 120% effort? No. Is it possible to run something at 120% capacity? Depending on how you define things, that might be possible. Um, in terms of just, you know, can you like override it and whatnot? Um, you definitely cannot give more than 100%. You can't give more than your maximum. What is your probability of winning? Can you ever have a negative probability of winning? No, no matter how bad you are, the answer is always gonna be between zero and one. So this is one of the reasons we love calculus. The areas under curves gives us probability. So if I wanna know what's the probability X takes on a value between A and B, I just find the area from A to B. If I have a closed form expression for the antiderivative, I can then write this down very nicely. If not, I have to use numerical techniques. That's fine, there's numerical techniques. So some of the key items we have from probability is the mean or the average value. And the way you find that is you take every possible value X, you weight it by the probability it occurs, and then you just integrate. You've all seen this in a discrete case in classes where say the midterm, let's say the, let's say the final is 40%, midterm 30%, homework 20%, class participation 10%. If you wanna calculate your average grade, it's final times 0.4 plus midterm times 0.3 plus homework times 0.2 plus class participation times 0.1. That weighted average, and over here, this is just giving you the mean of a distribution. The next thing we need is the variance or how spread out something is. So we integrate X minus mu squared times the probability. So the more mass we have near the mean, typically the smaller this is going to be. You know, if I have one or two real outliers, you know, if you know, Elon Musk or Bill and Melinda Gates you know, has a kid that comes into our class, this is going to throw off 
you know, the variance greatly in terms of your know, income of parents. It's not going to change the median income that much because it's only one point. So for a lot of uh, analyses, the median is far more stable than the mean. Okay. And then key concept is independence. Knowledge of one random variable gives no knowledge of another. Does it matter how I watch a sporting event if I'm not at the sporting venue, if I'm watching on my TV? Will that impact the game? I think most of us will agree that it does not make a difference, but a lot of us will still feel that I have to watch this way. There are a lot of you know, wonderful commercials about this. Those events should have no connection. If you're at the sporting event, does it matter how you watch the game? Yes, you could actually make a lot of noise and you can distract the other team and they could miss them. And that has absolutely happened. So you wanna be careful. When are events independent? When are they dependent? And so one of the big results in the subject is the central limit theorem. So if I have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables from some nice distribution, so not every distribution is nice, then if I look at the sum, well, if each one of them is on average mu, then I would expect the sum to be n times mu because I have n of them. So I then subtract off n times mu, and now I should have something that on average is zero. And then um, has everybody here seen variance and standard deviation? So if I now divide by sigma square root of n, this gives me something that has mean zero and variance one. So that this is in many situations to being normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. So which normal am I converging to? If I just look at the sums, then this is gonna to converge to a normal with mean n mu and variance sigma square root of n. By dividing like this, I converge to just a specific normal. Um, I am old enough that I remember textbooks that had tables of probabilities of normal distributions in the back. How many of you have had a stats textbook with tables of normal values? How many of them have had tables for more than just the standard normal? There's no need because you can always convert to the standard normal. So you only have to provide one table. This is the, I want to compare apples and apples. It's the same thing with, if you remember the change of base formula from logarithms. If I know logarithms in one base, I know logarithms in another base, I only need to provide one table. Now, I often do not want to do division, so I might have a table base 10, base E, base two. These are the ones that are used often. Yes, it's a little bit uh, unnecessary, but it's convenient. For here, I just need values of the standard normal. So let's try to see the central limit theorem in practice. And again, when you're writing things up, more pictures is better. More examples is better. Here is the normal, 0, 1. And here's a uniform distribution. And I've adjusted things so that they now have the same mean and the same variance. I want to compare apples and apples. Do you think this uniform distribution is pretty close to the bell curve, to the normal? It's not horrible. It's not great. I, let's imagine now we have the sum of two normals and compare. The sum of two normals is going to be a triangle. I said the sum of two uniforms. The sum of two uniforms is going to be a triangle. You've seen this if you've ever played games. Um, how many of you have ever played Monopoly? Right. Everybody's played Monopoly and you roll two die. What's the probability if you roll two die that the sum is a two? 136, right? Same thing as the probability of a 12. What's the probability you roll a seven for the sum? So to roll a seven, your first die can be anything. And then once your first die is fixed, there's one and only one value on the second die that works. So what's the probability that you roll a seven? One six. So you go from 136 for two or 12 to 636, and you can actually see it goes linear. So you get a nice triangle function that's a nice exercise. Does that look close to a Gaussian? That's actually not that bad. If I have sums of four uniform random variables, and again, I normalize it appropriately, that's looking even better. What if I had eight 
looking extremely good. Now, one of the questions you should always ask in a math class is the who gives a shit? Why am I doing this? What is the purpose of all this, right? You know, in stats, we like to approximate things by normal distributions. The normal distribution is somewhat easy to work with. We've tabulated it. Here is an explicit formula for the density of the sum of four uniform random variables. How many people think I actually calculated this by hand? Thank you. Okay. What do you think I did? I'm sorry. I actually did not search it. Mathematical. Yeah. I went to a computer program and said, calculate this for me, please. And then probably went back to watching Star Trek or sending administrative emails. This is not pleasant to work with. And you can only imagine what it's going to be. Now, you might notice two uniform, more uniforms than eight uniforms. Why do you think I'm, what do you think I would do next? 16. Anybody have any idea why I'm doing powers of two? Computer likes powers of two. If I know the if I know the density of a sum of two uniforms and I have four uniforms, that's just two plus two. If I know the density for the sum of four uniforms, I have another four uniforms, it's again itself. It would be much harder if they were different densities, if they were different numbers. So powers of two is often done in a lot of problems. It just makes things easier to work with. So now let's look at the normal distribution mod one. So here is a uh, normal distribution, mean zero, variance sigma squared. I'm looking at it mod one. As sigma goes to infinity, the normal distribution mod one goes to a uniform distribution on zero one. So that can be proven that as sigma gets larger and larger and larger, if you think about what's happening, I'm just erase the page. So we have, you know, here's our plot and you're here is a normal distribution, say with one value of sigma. And now if I increase you know, sigma, it's beginning to become a little bit more spread out. And if I increase you know, sigma even more, it's gonna become even more spread out. And you can see it's gonna be looking more and more like a uniform distribution over larger and larger ranges. And you, know, you have to go through and do all the math, but in the end of the day, you see that as the variance goes to infinity, if you look at a uniform mod one, it's going to just become a uniform distribution. Well, if we look at here where the variance is 0 0.01, does the green normal mod one, does that look like a uniform? You know, the gold line at one is the uniform distribution. Does the green look anything close to that? No. Well, if you think about what's going on, if the variance is 0 0.01, what's the standard deviation? Nope. If the variance is 0 0.01, what's the standard deviation? What's the square root of 0 0.01? 0 0.1. So the standard deviation is 0 0.1. So if you go basically 0 0.1 above or below zero, that's basically one standard deviation. Since we're looking at things mod one, if you go 0 0.1 above zero, that gets you to 0 0.1. If you go 0 0.1 below, that gets you to 0 0.9. For many distributions, most of the mass is within two standard deviations. So if I go two standard deviations, oh yeah, we can see over here, most of the mass is within two standard deviations. Most of it is less than 0.2 or greater than 0.8. Now, instead of looking at a variance of 0.01, let's look at a variance of 0.1, bless you. This is much closer to the uniform distribution now. No. Does this look like the uniform distribution? The variance is 0.5. Does this look uniform? Yo. Know, why does this look close? Because I mean, I see huge fluctuation, right? Yeah, I changed the scale. You know, thou shalt always look at the scale. The y-axis goes from 0.9999 to 1.0001. There's almost no fluctuation. So with the variance at just 0.5, and I love being able to write 0.5 period as being grammatically correct, with the variance at 0.5, this is already extremely close to the uniform distribution mod one. So you can only imagine what's gonna happen as sigma gets large. And so whenever you take a class from me, one of the takeaways I want you to have is if you ever see a product, take a log of them. You know, if you are teaching math to third graders, resist the temptation, but other than that in high level math, always take a logarithm. So imagine I have a bunch of random variables, say x1 through xn. 
I'm going to let W be their product. And so I now take the logarithm. So if I take the logarithm, let's let Yi be the log of Xi, and let's let Vn be the log of the Ws. Well, the log of a product is the sum of the logs, right? So if I take Vn, it's just going to be the log of the product. So that becomes the sum of the logs. What I would love to do now is say the central limit theorem kicks in. And if the central limit theorem kicks in, I have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables. It converges to a Gaussian with a growing variance. And then a Gaussian with a growing variance, mod one is going to converge to being uniformly distributed. Ah, and if something's logarithm is uniformly distributed, then when you exponentiate, you get benefit. So this is a high level explanation of why a lot of different systems are Benford. Okay, I'm gonna quickly go through applications. Uh, I'm not gonna go through people's tax returns. I'll just do as a quick example. There was an audit of a bank and they found that there was a huge spike with numbers starting with, anybody wanna guess what digit? Nope, 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 nope. Yes, four, excellent, huge numbers starting with four. And then they looked at the second digit and they saw it was a lot of four what? Nope. Yeah, a lot of four eights, four nines. Does anybody have a credit card? Okay. Can I have your credit card for a second? This is trust. So Paul has just lost his credit card. Thank you. What should Paul do? Cancel it. But imagine that before Paul gets the chance to cancel because I'm going to give him busy. Go and make some. Are you responsible for those purchases? Yes. Well, what happens? You you call up the bank. You say your credit card was stolen, and you're not liable. Now imagine you're the bank. So you've just had a credit card reported as stolen, and let's say you know I didn't have that much time. I filled up my car with gas, which could actually be a lot of money these days. And I went to stop and shop and quickly picked up some food. Well, let's say I put on $75. Is it worth the credit card's time, the company's time to track me down for 75 bucks? What if, however, I bought you know, three uh, Porsches and a Mustang? Yeah, at this point, it's now worth it. So what credit card companies had is they had this wonderful value of $5,000. Anything below $5,000, they just wrote off as it's not worth the time to investigate. Anything above $5,000, they investigated. So what was going on here is somebody was working for a credit card company and they were having their friends apply for credit cards, run up debts just below 5,000 so that they could write them off without generating any internal investigations. And this was discovered by a digit analysis and they noticed a small spike of you know, four eights and four nines. And they eventually tracked it down to this one person and says, wow, you're generating a lot of 48 and four nines in your write-offs. It's almost as if people know exactly how much they can spend before it generates you know, a need to investigate. Not that you would ever do this, but what would you have done if you were trying to cheat? Make it benefit be a little bit you know, more fluctuating about what you're doing. All right, so this is just one of the many applications of Benford's law. And so we'll talk maybe a little bit more next time about some more applications. And then this is a good place to stop.